Grace, mercy, and peace, these are the gifts that are yours from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we might look at our world's morality these days, and we might despair, we might lament the way the world acts in such immoral ways. When we look at our our entertainment, whether it's our music or our TV or movies, we see violence and pornographic material that always seeks to shock us even further, to shock us in just how evil and sinful our world is depicted. And of course, this is not just in entertainment, this is in our normal public discourse. It is not uncommon to hear profanity and vulgarity in everyday conversation, in in the news, or just with our neighbor. Yes, this profanity and vulgarity has become so commonplace, we see it just out there on bumper stickers and flags on people's homes that have vile words that we do not wish to teach our children. And so when we look at the morality of the world today and where things have gone, It might be easy to ask the question, do people even still want to be good? Are we still striving to be good people? Are we still wanting to be better people? Or are we content just to be awful sinners? Well, Jesus says in our Gospel reading today, He did not come to abolish the law. He did not come to relax one iota of the law. No, not one dot of the law, but rather he came to fulfill the law. The law still matters, and therefore righteousness, goodness, still matters. I think in some ways people still want to be good. People still desire to be better people. We just don't have as a society a common definition of what good is. We still want to perhaps read self-help books and improve ourselves. We, we want to go to the gym or go to yoga class and improve ourselves physically. Or perhaps we want to eat healthier foods and improve ourselves in our health that way. We still want self-improvement. We still want, deep down, to be better human beings. Well, the Pharisees of Jesus' day were very concerned about being good, about being perfect, or at least appearing good before others. They were so good that they not only claimed to follow the Ten Commandments, but they also added to those Ten Commandments. Second commandment says, you shall not misuse the Lord's name. And they said, we will not only not misuse it, but we're not going to use it at all. We are, we are so good that we are not even going to use God's name, period. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy? Well, the Pharisees added to that and saying, not only are we going to dedicate the Sabbath day to hearing the Word of God, but we are going to do absolutely no work on the Sabbath day. And anybody caught doing work on the Sabbath day, we will, in all of our righteousness, openly condemn them for the work that they do. Yes, that was the Pharisees of their day. They were seen not as the bad guys, as we might understand them when we hear about the Pharisees in our scripture readings. They weren't the bad guys in the people's mind. No, they were the best of the best. They were the good guys, the really good ones, the people that we would aspire to be, to be better people. Well, who are the Pharisees of our day, we might ask? Who are they that 
Many people in our culture would exalt or perhaps even exalt themselves as the light bearers of our society. What is seen as good in our culture? As I was contemplating this this week, I kept going back to this idea of wokeism in our culture. You've heard of wokeism, right? It finds its roots in anti-racism. Anti-racism is the wokeism that is, that is the new good in our society. To not only not be racist, which is good, it is good not to be racist, but also to proclaim your goodness, to show how not racist you are by pointing out constantly who is bad. That is the wokeism that we find ourselves in. Now, I want to be clear. Racism is bad. Racism is evil. It is ungodly. It is not the way of Christ. But the woke anti-racist goes a step further. That anybody who demonstrates behaviors that they deem unacceptable or that they deem racist, well, that person must be canceled, must be removed from society, must be outcast. And in their mind, everyone, everyone, is to some degree a racist. By virtue of what sports you enjoy, or what kind of car you drive, or the money in your bank account, the fact that you have a bank account, well, that finds its roots in racism, they would say. And so everybody, to some degree, has this sense of racism. And by pointing their pharisaical fingers at you, they become the Pharisees of our time. You are a racist. Be more like me. I, I am good. And our society, our culture, largely has bought into this. We look to these people as the moral leaders of our culture, of our society. We look to them to determine who are the good and who are the bad in our society. This is called virtue signaling. The more you point out others' errors, others' problems, or others' perceived problems, the more you exalt yourself as being the good in our society. This is done on social media. This is done by, by way of protesting outside of city halls. This is done all sorts of ways to lift themselves up as the good and to point fingers to us as the bad. Now, there was a time, I think, when pastors were seen as the light bearers, the ones who were the light of the world in our culture and in our society. But I think this new religion of wokeism is taking its place. I think as a pastor, I have seen examples where if I am wearing my clerical collar out in public, there were times when people would treat me a little better. There was one time when somebody at Starbucks, I had a gift card and I was in the drive-thru at Starbucks, the car in front of me bought my coffee at Starbucks. And I have a feeling it was because I was wearing my clerical collar and I have a feeling it's because they had a St. Bartholomew sticker on their van that they thought I was a Catholic father, a Catholic priest, and so therefore they bought my coffee. That was appreciated. There was also a time when uh, on my way home from church, back when we lived in Columbus, a little longer drive home, I was pulled over by a sheriff wearing my clerical collar, and he said, I appreciate the work you do, Father. Have a good day. And I did not have the heart to correct him and tell him I was not Catholic. There were times when I had been treated well for being a pastor. But in large part, my experience has mostly been either being ignored or kind of given a side eye of suspicion. What's he doing here? What's, what's he all about? There is concern. The, the Christian pastor is not given, is not seen by society as the light bearer in our society anymore. This has been replaced, I believe, by a new religion in our culture. The Pharisees were indeed the best 
of all people. Jewish fathers would hope that their daughter would bring home a nice Pharisee as their boyfriend. You see, they weren't the bad guys. They were the good guys. They were the best guys. And we know they were good because they kept telling us how good they were. And Jesus doesn't dispute this. Jesus doesn't say that the Pharisees weren't good. He simply says they weren't good enough. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, Jesus says, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Now what a blow this would be to the people who aspire to be like the Pharisees. You're saying that I'm not as good as the Pharisees, and even if I were, I can't go to heaven? Even if I weren't the best people in our society, I'm still not fit for the kingdom of God? Well, then what hope is there? Well, there is no hope. None at all if we are counting on our own works, our own goodness to enter the kingdom of heaven. If we are looking to ourselves, well, quite frankly, brothers and sisters, we are not going to make it. Even the best of us, the ones who claim to keep the entire law, and even those of us who might even add to it just to show how observant we are to God's law, well, Jesus says it's not good enough. But thanks be to God, there is one whose righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, one who did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, every iota and every dot of it, for you. He who exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees imputes his righteousness to you. And so when someone says, I have kept the law perfectly, or I have tried to be a good person, or I have done my best, we say, I have something better. I have the righteousness of Christ. And the righteousness of Christ does indeed exceed that of even the scribes and the Pharisees. This is why the Apostle Paul says, I claim to know nothing, even though he knew a lot, even though Paul himself was a Pharisee of all Pharisees, and Paul himself could have made the claim that he kept the law as good as anyone possibly could, Paul says, I claim to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. Because that is the righteousness that is imputed to Paul and to us, that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. That is the righteousness that saves. And so that is the righteousness that Paul proclaims and that I from this pulpit proclaim to you today. The righteousness of Christ given to you, given for you, that everything Jesus did, every iota and dot of the law that he fulfilled, he fulfilled so that you may be declared righteous in the sight of God our Father. That forgiveness of sins that Jesus gives is given to you even today, as we heard in the absolution earlier, and as we will receive in our mouths in the Lord's Supper. The forgiveness of sins, the righteousness of Christ, given for you. And so, dear brothers in Christ, as we are called to let our lights shine and to be the salt of the earth, we are so, not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is and what he has given to us. Yes, you, dear brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees because your righteousness is none other than Christ's righteousness. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.